from the American Bar Association Law Museum in Chicago, the section of Antitrust Law presents the Oral History Project, interviews with the leaders who have made significant contributions to antitrust law practice. Hi, I'm Roxanne Busey of Baker and McKenzie in Chicago. I am here today to interview Judge Wood from the United States uh, Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Wood, thank you for coming this morning. I'd like to begin asking you about your background. Uh, I understand that you were born in New Jersey and then you attended the University of Texas and its law school. Uh, can you tell me how, how that all came about? That came about very simply. When I was 15 years old, my father came home one day and announced that Exxon was transferring him from New York to Houston. I greeted this news with dismay, but it all worked out in the it, end. It did. And what led you to a career in the law? That was an indirect path for me. At the time I graduated from college, I thought I was going to do graduate work in comparative literature. But about two weeks before I, start, I was supposed to start, I decided that this was not what I wanted to do. So I floated around for about six or seven months and a friend said, you know, law school would be perfect for you and since I couldn't think of anything else, I went to law school and lo and behold he was right. When did you become interested in antitrust law in general and in international antitrust law in particular? Well the international element of things dated back to even the interest in comparative literature. I enjoyed learning about foreign cultures, learning foreign languages. The antitrust side of that began the summer after my second year in law school when I was an associate at Covington and Burling working for some wonderful antitrust lawyers. And this was in Washington? In Washington. Okay. Can you tell us about your clerkships, first with Judge Goldberg in the Fifth Circuit and then with Justice Blackmun on the Supreme Court? Well, I was encouraged by faculty members at the University of Texas. Judge Goldberg in particular had a wonderful reputation as a man of great courage. He was part of the old Fifth Circuit that had helped desegregate the South, a man of great intelligence, a very colorful personality, and he was all of those things and much more. And the Supreme Court, for most law students, speaks for itself. Exactly. It's an excellent opportunity. Did you know then that you wanted to be a judge yourself? I would say I thought that was so far out of reach. It wasn't something I seriously thought I could ever do. Now, like many clerks, I thought it would be a wonderful thing to do, but it didn't strike me as possible. While you were clerking at the Supreme Court, there were many important decisions that came down. Uh, GTE Sylvania, Fortner II, Brunswick, and uh, Hoover versus Ronwin. How did these decisions influence your views uh, or your interest in antitrust law? I would say taken together they strengthen very much what had been a growing interest in antitrust since that summer at Covington and Burling because in those decisions especially let's take GTE Sylvania the Supreme Court was in the process of reshaping the way we think about antitrust law and to be walking around the corridors talking about these issues with the other clerks was a very exciting thing to do. Okay. After you um, were a clerk for the Supreme Court, then did you go to work for the State Department? Yes, I went to work at the Legal Advisor's Office at the State Department. Okay, and what, what were your responsibilities there? I really did two things. I was in the Economic and Business section of the Legal Advisor's Office, so I worked on things like um, a code of conduct for bribery, code of conduct for the transfer of technology with developing countries, what they called a restrictive business practices code, which was really a very early kind of international antitrust code. And I also did some miscellaneous things for the legal advisor as a special assistant, like working on the normalization of relations with the People's Republic of China. And from there, you went back to Covington and Burling? That's right, and picked up where I left off on the antitrust case that I had been working on. And what case was that? Uh, it was private litigation brought by the Purex Corporation against Procter & Gamble and Clorox that arose out of the 1957 acquisition that Procter & Gamble had made of the Clorox Bleach Company. Okay. Uh, when did you decide to leave private practice and uh, begin teaching at, the, at Georgetown University? 
that time, of course, I was living in the District of Columbia, and I had explained to Covington and Burling that I had a great interest in teaching. They said fine, so it was a very natural step to begin my teaching career at Georgetown. But I, in fact, stayed there only one year. The very next year, I came to Chicago and started teaching at the University of Chicago. Okay, and what did you teach at both places? What did you teach at uh, Georgetown and then at the University of Chicago? My first year of teaching, I taught antitrust and I taught civil procedure. Mm -hmm. At the University of Chicago, there were already people teaching antitrust, so I offered a seminar in international antitrust. I still taught civil procedure. I began to teach international economic law courses, international trade, international business. And then I understand that for a certain period of time, you were associate dean at the, at the law school. How did that come about? What were your responsibilities? In the late 1980s, when Jeffrey Stone was dean, by that time I had gotten tenure at the law school and Jeff asked me if I would work as his associate dean, which is a position that involves handling the academic side of the, of the institution, talking to everybody in the faculty to see what they're willing to teach, setting up special lectures. And in those days it ran all the way down, I would say, to the parking lot irate parents calling to wonder why their son or daughter had not received a good parking place. And then in 1986 you served as a special assistant at the Antitrust Division. How did that come about? Indirectly it arose out of the International Antitrust seminars that I had been teaching, which my colleague Frank Easterbrook was well aware of. He knew that this was an interest. He was a classmate of Douglas Ginsburg, who at the time was Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust, and Douglas wanted to revise an old set of international guidelines. So I think one thing led to another, and he asked me if I would be willing to work on that. And the old set of guidelines, these were in the 1977 international guidelines. That's right. Okay. And what were the kinds of changes that were uh, made in the 1988 guidelines? The 1988 guidelines wound up doing two things. First, they brought the 77 guidelines up to date insofar as they discussed how far into foreign countries our enforcement efforts would reach. The world was changing very rapidly at that time. The other thing the 1988 guidelines did was they were used as a vehicle for expressing the antitrust philosophy of the Reagan administration. By that time, the uh, FTAIA had been passed. That's right. Uh, it was a 1980 statute, and there was also a statute called the Export Trading Company, which were reflected in the 1988 guidelines. Uh, Judge Wood, if you would, I would like you to set the stage for us in the 1980s, uh, the state of international antitrust at that time. Uh, you once described the United States in one of your articles as the first kid on the block. Uh, was it the only kid on the block, or were there any other nations that had reached a consensus with the United States? When I said it was the first kid on the block, it was slightly inaccurate, as our Canadian friends would say, because their first antitrust law was passed in 1889, whereas ours came along in 1890. Okay. But they hadn't done anything with theirs, as they would quickly tell you to speak of. And so it wasn't until after World War II that other countries began seriously looking at this, and not many had developed their, what we, they would call competition law, by that time. So as of, if you will, the middle 1970s, you see European law just starting to come into its own. You see some of the member state laws, but very few countries were in a position to think about the global reach of antitrust. The United States had been doing so since the end of World War II. And you said in, in that same article that this was an important concession to the American point of view, allegiance to the principle of competition. Do you have insight as to how there was this, in, this allegiance to this new principle? Well, it began with, I think, the development of the European laws. And as the Europeans worked in those days, in the late 50s through the 60s, 70s, 80s, on developing their common market, as they would have called it at that time, they began to see the virtues of competition from a consumer welfare point of view as well as a business development standpoint. Unctad, 
can you tell us a little bit about UNCTAD, what it is and what its role was at that time? UNCTAD is a, stands for the UN Conference on Trade and Development. It is an organization whose members are all of the members of the General Assembly of the UN. And the interesting thing about UNCTAD is that it was one country, one vote, and thus the developing countries had a very strong voice in UNCTAD. There are other economic institutions at the UN, but they tended to be organized with weighted voting. So the developing countries were trying to use UNCTAD around the late 70s, early 80s to express their own view of how they thought competition principles ought to run, how they thought intellectual property should be governed, and there was real tension actually between their view and that of the developed countries, including the United States. Did they propose just principles or was there a model law? What, what was the deliverable that came out of that group? They were interested in two things. They were interested in a legally binding set of rules on competition or restrictive business practices, as they called it, for the world that heavily regulated multinational enterprises and that um, made special concessions to the position of developing countries. The United States and its partners, primarily the European countries and Japan and Australia and others, didn't want a binding code. The United States said, no, it's okay to express uh, principles, but they can't be legally binding. So there was a great battle about that. What came out of it were non-binding principles, and they did, I think, at one point draft a proposed model law. Similarly, what role did the OECD play at that time? That is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It is, if you will, the developed countries club. At the time, it was a smaller organization, maybe 23, 24 countries. It's by now probably in excess of 30. But they were doing two things. They were trying to express competition principles that were desirable for all members to follow, and everything they do is advisory. And at the same time, they were an organizing point for the developed countries for larger fora like UNCTAD. Mm -hmm. Mexico. I think you've indicated at one point that Mexico played an important role at this period of time. Can mm -hmm. you explain that a little bit more? Sure. Well, Mexico, like many countries in Latin America, through the decade of the 1980s, was rethinking how it wanted its economy organized. And by the time you get to early 1990, Mexico was interested in becoming part of what became NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. Mexico was liberalizing its economy. So they went out and studied all of the competition antitrust laws they could find in the world, and they drafted their own in around 1992 as a state-of-the-art excellent law with institutions that fit Mexico and they became by doing that a real model for the rest of Latin America. There were some efforts to reduce conflicts among nations during the 1980s. Agreements were reached between the United States and Germany, Australia and Canada based on OECD recommendations in 1967. Can you explain the importance of these agreements? Um, there had been some very contentious incidents, one of them arising out of an uh, international investigation of shipping cartels that the United States had done, one arising out of an international investigation of a uranium cartel that the United States had pursued, which had led to a lot of diplomatic tension. So actually starting in the late 1970s, we negotiated bilateral agreements with people to say, if we are going to be conducting an investigation that touches on your interests somehow, we'll let you know. We'll see if we can find a way to do this in as smooth a manner as possible. And the OECD then recommended that member states should always notify one another when something like that was happening. So it was principally a notification agreement. Right, a notification conflict reduction mechanism. Mm -hmm. The agreement with the EC did not come into effect until 1991 with some positive comedy provisions. You have said that although unprecedented, this was still a far cry from the more ambitious proposals for positive comedy advocated by Assistant Attorney General Jim Rill. Can you elaborate on this? Well, what I meant by that 
was first of all to give uh, former Assistant Attorney General Real full credit for changing the tone of these agreements from one of conflict resolution to one of cooperation to one that sent the message, we're all in this game together. Mm -hmm. That was a fabulous achievement. Mm -hmm. And the positive comedy provisions in the EC agreement, which have since been replicated in many more, said, if we see a problem and it's partly on your territory, you'll help us out. We can ask. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no compulsion, but you can ask. And it set a very different tone. What it doesn't do, and what some thought there should be, maybe not so much even Jim Rill as Sir Leon Britton uh, for the Europeans, was an actual binding antitrust agreement where you actually had to do something. Mm -hmm. In 1993 to 95, you returned to the antitrust division with different responsibilities. Can you tell us a little bit about what your responsibilities were at that time? I think the opportunity arose out of a lot of things. The work I had done in the mid-80s for the Department of Justice, something uh, a, a report that Assistant Attorney General Rill had asked me to work on as the U.S. person, which came to be known as the Wish Wood Report on merger um, regulation. And I had done a lot, I, by that time I'd written a lot in international antitrust. All of those things added up to the point that when new Assistant Attorney General Ann Bingaman was thinking, what will I do with my international agenda, Ann told me that she talked to quite a few former assistant attorneys general, and they all said, there's one person you should call, and, and that was me. Judge Wood, yeah. <laughs> yes. I understand. Okay. And, and your accomplishments during this period, were the international guidelines again reviewed? Yes. We revised again the international guidelines, and perhaps the greatest accomplishment is we began cooperative investigations with other countries. One of the first ones was the Microsoft investigation where we actually went to Microsoft and said to them, the United States Department of Justice is doing some investigations that concern you, so are the Europeans, will you agree to let us do this cooperatively? And they said yes, because they saw it as in their interest to have one solution for their obviously global business, not two potentially conflicting solutions. And we built on that. Uh, refresh my recollection. So there was a there was a cooperative investigation. There were two separate proceedings brought, one by the U.S. and one by the Correct. EU. And there was a single resolution, or there were separate resolutions? Nominally separate resolutions, but in content, one resolution. Okay. And that's basically referred to as Microsoft One. That's right. <laughs> that, well, we didn't know there was a Roman numeral after the time. <laughs> right. Yes, okay. Microsoft right. One. Okay. Uh, during this time, uh, I know there were a lot of nations, I think 53, that by 1995 had uh, competition laws of one sort or another. Um, did you foresee that this was coming? And, or what even was the cause of this uh, new wave of laws? I can't say that, what I, that I foresaw that between 1995 and 2007, 2008, that number would essentially double. Uh, that's what really surprises me. It had been evolving slowly over time as more countries thought that a market economy was a good idea. And then if you're going to have a market economy, people quickly came to the notion that one thing you need is an antitrust law. Right, to, to monitor that market economy. That's right. Um, you mentioned the Wish Wood Report, and I know you were involved at the OECD with respect to that report, with respect to, uh, with Professor Richard Wish. Can you tell us a little bit more about that study and what you found and what the reaction was to it? It's a wonderful opportunity for Professor Wish and me. We were asked by the OECD to look in detail at eight different transactions, mergers, uh, acquisitions, I'll just call them all mergers. And the one thing that these transactions had in common is they had all been investigated by multiple authorities some as many as nine or ten different authorities, some as few as three different authorities. But the OECD asked us to find out what were the costs of this duplication, were there any benefits, what, what could we tell them about this increasing state of affairs. Mm -hmm. And you had some recommendations in the report? Yes, we did. We, having studied the eight uh, transactions and 
personally interviewed people from the companies, their lawyers, people from the enforcement authorities, anyone who was willing to sit down with us and talk. We talked to, we flew all over the world doing this. We thought it would be a shame not to try to pull this together into some kind of summary, if you will, and we recommended things like common forms, we recommended uh, things, and, and in some ways our recommendations were simply conveying the recommendations of the people we had talked to. Many in the business community said to us, we don't care what you're asking, but if you have the same deadlines, the same forms, ask for the same information, and we know when things are okay, that's all we need. It sounds like your report would be relevant still today. The OECD from time to time has thought of redoing it, and I have told them that's a job for some younger, more energetic law professor, not me. Judge Wood, you've been interested in and have written on issues involving international antitrust for some time. I'd like to talk with you about your views, how they developed and possibly how they've changed since the mid-1980s to the present. In 1992, after you returned to the University of Chicago Law School, you wrote an article entitled The Impossible Dream, in which you noted that, and I quote, efforts to obtain an international consensus on competition law principles have this far met only with modest success, to the point that the search for either harmonization of national competition rules or the establishment of any kind of supranational procedural or substantive regime seems to be an impossible dream. Would you still say this today? I really would still say that today because, first of all, the history is still the history. People have had different goals for what they wanted from an international antitrust regime, and people who are interested in the details of what the old, not so successful ones are can look at my article or many other things. I've written other things to express what those differences are, but you can look, for example, at what we might call monopoly behavior or dominant firm behavior in today's world, and you still see remarkable differences, even between the United States and Europe, mm -hmm. two entities that are sophisticated um, at, at the highest level, that have wonderfully functioning market economies, and yet the Europeans think intervention is appropriate at an earlier level than we would. I would summarize the difference that way. Okay. On, on that particular issue, do you think there has been any a progress uh, towards substantive convergence, or do you think that we're pretty much where we were uh, back in the 1980s? There has been progress methodologically, I would say. I think the Europeans and many, many other countries around the world, no matter where they are, are committed to economically sound analysis. They're committed to um, letting the market work as it, as it should work, not regulating quote unquote too much, mm -hmm. but where too much kicks in is a little bit difficult to say, and how much one is going to trust the market to fix things and how quickly you think the market should fix things lead to differences in final result. You have written a great deal about substantive harmonization. In your 2005 article you focused on three areas, uh, concerted actions, single firm conduct, and mergers. I think you've talked a little bit about single firm conduct, uh, but I'd like to talk with you a little bit about cartels. You stated that perhaps the highest degree of global consensus is with regard to agreements between competitors, particularly hardcore cartels. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the progress that we've made in this area and what we have left to do? Again, there's certainly progress. The OECD has a recommendation on hardcore cartels. People seem to understand what a hardcore cartel is. And I can't even say that for the time when I was in the Justice Department when we had a workshop on hardcore cartels at the OECD and we all wound up throwing our hands up in the air. Because the problem very simply is this, we can all say that a hardcore cartel occurs when competitors get together and agree on the price or the output or something equivalent for a particular good. 
and they're illegal unless they aren't illegal. And one of the times they aren't illegal is when the trade authorities say, oh, we have a crisis in the aluminum market, we have a crisis in the uranium market. And one of the other times they might not be illegal is if a particular country says, yes, but this is a distressed industry. People are leaving the field. And so it's a situation with a gigantic asterisk after the always word, and that's what has always worried me. I know you've also indicated that there are differences in mergers and acquisitions. Have we made any progress in these areas? There's a lot of progress vis-a-vis -vis the Europeans substantively, especially in the recent reviews the Europeans have made of their merger regime since they have managed to reinterpret their merger rules in a way that now encompasses both what we would call unilateral effects and coordinated effects. There was some question for a long time about whether their regime looked at both of those kinds of potential anti-competitive effects. So I think substantively we are really making some progress. They still have a different view than the United States about vertical consequences inside mergers and the uh, GE Honeywell dispute between Europe and the United States illustrates that reasonably well. And of, so of the three areas, the, the single firm conduct that you referred to first, the cartels and um, the mergers, uh, the greatest progress has, in your view, been made in, in which area? The, le the least being in the single firm conduct? The least in the single firm conduct, there's a great deal of similar viewpoint with respect to horizontal behavior as well. So horizontal and mergers I would put the same way. There are still differences with verticals, although that gap is narrowing. Mm -hmm. In an article uh, you wrote in 2005, you say that you're going to take a fresh look at an old subject and imagine what the rules of a new global antitrust regime ought to be. Have you changed your point of view? Do you now believe that a global competition code is the way to go or is feasible? Not really. The reason I decided to write that article is because I had thought for a long time that any one of us could sit down and write a code for the world as long as everyone else in the world was willing to agree with our code. So you and I could write one, but it's quite possible that some other people might want to see different things. But then I thought, well, it would be interesting to engage the debate this far to just put down what I think such a code ought to include, and then if other people don't have different views, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe everybody does agree with, with what my code would look like, and so, so much the better if they do. But I rather thought it would be helpful to advance the debate to, to bring to the surface where these disagreements still exist. Did you get any reaction to your article? Well, it's been misunderstood by some people as a sign that I'm now ready to negotiate a code, which is not uh, the case. It's not uh, my job, number one, but it's not the case, number right. two. Right. Uh, but so that was the main reaction, <laughs> yes. misunderstanding. Yes. yes. Okay. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about unilateral laws and unilateral enforcement. Uh, at one point you wrote, over the long run, the cost of no international antitrust solution, at least among the major economic players, will become prohibitively high. Have we reached that point? Are the costs prohibitively high? They're very high. I mean, talking to people that I know who deal with mergers, for example, is to talk to a desperate group of people. The filings that Richard and I saw happening in nine countries 15 years ago are now happening in 20, 30 large, large numbers of countries. And I had thought at one point maybe countries, including the United States, need to be able to sit down and say, what do we really need? Is it possible we could develop either a common form or perhaps simply mutual recognition of other people's forms? And the question there is, is it more important to know that the transaction is happening at some appropriate advanced time? Or is it more important to get all the detailed information you get from whatever form you're asked to give? Mm -hmm. In the patent area, there's a treaty system that allows that kind of mutual recognition of filings. And I had wondered 
off and on whether something like that could be adapted for mergers. But it hasn't been accepted at this point? No, no. not yet. Okay. You've also noted that with the creation of the common market in 1958, there was a commitment to competition principles, but objections to extraterritorial enforcement based on procedural grounds continued. Uh, when did the EU reach consensus that national boundaries are of little relevance to anti-competitive behavior that affects extraterritorially be beyond national borders? Well, it's a very interesting institutional study because the part of the EU that recognized this was the Court of Justice. And we have the debate in this country about what should the courts be doing versus what should other institutions be doing. They have a similar debate, but there was a case that arose that involved a wood pulp export cartel, mm -hmm. actually, from the United States that was selling its products into the European Union at supposedly fixed prices. And the European Court of Justice in the very famous wood pulp case around 1982 said, well, that foreign cartel, foreign means in the United States, is having a direct effect in the European territory mm -hmm. and we're allowed to prosecute that. Mm -hmm. And we said, yes, that's what we've been trying to tell you all along. Right. It's your consumers that are hurt. So you are a logical Right. person to be pursuing it. Right. So we have an increase in the number of laws and now we have countries recognizing that the extraterritorial implication uh, is something that they can actually sue on, that they can actually be involved right. in. Right. And, and we said, uh, again, we, we have tried to protect our markets for American consumers and it doesn't really matter if the conspirators are in half a dozen different countries, if they're all located in Dallas. Mm -hmm. uh, if they're hurting American consumers, they're hurting American consumers. Right. Uh, you have from time to time kind of done a, a, a review of how we've progressed in terms of enforcement and in assessing cooperative enforcement, uh, you said in about 2003 in an article, that the worst part of the track record thus far is the failure of countries that already have common laws to find ways to coordinate their enforcement efforts more effectively. Mm -hmm. Can you comment further on this? Sure. In 1994, Congress passed a statute called the IAEAA, which shows what bad acronym namers we were. We had worked on this legislation, but it stands for the International Antitrust Enforcement Assistance Act. And it authorizes the U.S. authorities, the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission to enter into bilateral agreements with their counterparts in other countries under which confidential information could be shared, joint prosecutions or civil actions or injunctive actions can take place. And our hope at the time was that we would be able to develop a series of agreements that look a lot like similar agreements that the Securities and Exchange Commission has with its counterparts mm -hmm. overseas for very similar reasons. Mm -hmm. Not many of those agreements to this day have taken place. And we do have one with Australia. Mm -hmm. We have other agreements that are almost the equivalent with Canada. That We have a few but we don't have very many agreements that would even allow us in a case where both countries recognized that this is behavior that needs to be pursued, our hands are tied. The reason that we haven't been able to convince other countries to execute these agreements with us? I think there are a couple of reasons. One is maybe the old reason that they're concerned that somehow the United States is going to use this ability to cooperate in a way they don't like. I, when I was at Justice, tried very hard to point out that cooperation would never happen unless both parties thought it was in their own best interest. A second problem, I think, is maybe the political reality of where competition law sits in many countries. Frequently, I would hear from foreign officials we can't agree to cooperate with the United States because the business community won't like it. And my response was, well, there's a certain fox guarding the hen house quality to that remark. Why would they want you to be a better antitrust enforcer if they would prefer that you not bother them at all? 
And in our country, we don't have that problem so much. I think there's much more of a competition culture. Over the years, you've identified at least three models of harmonization, uh, soft, um, hard, and intermediate. Um, you suggest that the, that the way to go is with soft harmonization. Do you still advocate this for both substantive and procedural convergence? I do, I mean, but what I mean by soft harmonization is really from the grassroots up. So each country can be convinced that it is in fact in its own best interest to follow an economically sound, reasonable competition law. Not a competition law, for example, that spends all of its time worrying about whether you're going to have you know, a promotional product to give away when you're selling something. There are all sorts of strange competition laws out there. And I would say the new international competition, not so new, but the new international competition network is an excellent example of the success of soft harmonization. Like-minded countries have come together. They define projects for themselves. They're working on ways to make enforcement more effective. And they're at least making that progress. Maybe it's slow, but it's better than not at all. Well, I know along the way you've expressed some frustration with the limitations of the softer approach, uh, but it sounds like you're still uh, committed to that as being the most effective and best approach. Over the long run, I think it is, because I think when change happens, it will be very solid change that happens, not something that's just a veneer on top of a country's law that they then promptly turn around and ignore. Mm -hmm. Are concerns about confidentiality and privacy uh, barriers to more cooperative agreements? Yes, the confidentiality concern is probably the biggest barrier there is between procedural cooperation and convergence. The image of the United States um, by people outside the United States is that between grand juries and our discovery procedures in civil cases, companies are very, very exposed, uh, and so is their confidential information. By the same token, uh, they don't want Americans to come into their legal systems, get information, and as they see it, take it back to the United States and have it seep back out through these various mechanisms we have. I'd like to ask you about what role you think that the United States should play at this time. In, at one point in 1995, you noted that rather than trying to barge around the world, unilaterally enforcing our law, unilaterally trying to grab evidence in other countries, pushing remedies on people that they do not want, let us try cooperating with other authorities. And then in a later article in 2005, you discuss some possible roles for the United States. Um, you say one possibility is that the U United States is unique and therefore has developed a unique antitrust law so there will never be a unified global competition principle. A second possibility is that the United States has had more experience and in time others will adopt our principles. And thirdly, you suggest that the U.S. and the rest of the world are feeling their way toward a common solution that will be informed by the experience of all. And my question is, what role do you think is best for the United States at this time? Certainly, the second or the third of those, I think the United States still has a great deal to offer other countries and will as long as there is such a thing as antitrust law. And that's not only because of our longer experience, but it's because of our deeper experience. As I used to tell people when I was at the Department of Justice, there's no shortage of people willing to enforce the antitrust laws in the United States because we have not one but two federal agencies. We have all 50 state attorneys general out there ready to enforce, and we have any private plaintiff injured in his business or property who's out there to enforce. So we've got a rich, rich set of fact patterns, decisions, uh, things you can evaluate to see what worked and what didn't work, and I think it's great that we can share that with, with others. Uh, so I think that's the kind of leadership we ought to be giving, whether it's through the ICN or whether it's in a more informal way. Did you want to comment more on the ICN? You, you stated that as playing a very positive role. Um, is that a role that you anticipate um, will lead to immediate results? Has it led to immediate results, or is it more of a long-term uh, way to uh, some type of uh, understanding? I think it already has led to some results. It depends on how broad the project they define for themselves 
is, but I think they have defined for themselves projects such as best practices in merger enforcement, uh, what should you do uh, in terms of these forms, and even if the United States is deeply committed to the Hart Scott Rodino system and the Europeans are deeply committed to their system, there are a lot of other countries in the world, and even if they coordinated around something, that would be a big step. I'd like to ask you some more questions uh, with respect to your experience on the bench. Uh, but before I do so, I wondered if you could just tell me, do you think that your views have changed uh, over time since the 1980s? Are they still the same today as they were then? I think they're basically the same now. What has changed is the commitment of other countries around the world to antitrust principles. And as they become more open to antitrust principles, the opportunities for cooperation, the opportunities to achieve the goals that we think are worth achieving in a way that doesn't ruffle feathers have become much greater. So the, the scene has shifted, but I'm not sure that my own approach to it has so much. You have been on the bench for more than a decade, and you've been involved in some interesting and important antitrust cases. Are there any of those that you would like to discuss today? Well, one case I would single out was the Toys R Us case, which had to do with whether Toys R Us was essentially serving as a ringleader of a cartel of toy manufacturers. It's a little bit unusual for us, but Toys R Us was seen by many of the toy manufacturers as essential to their marketing strategy. They couldn't walk away from Toys R Us and simply sell through warehouse stores or sell through discount outlets or sell through specialized toy stores. It's a good 30, 40 percent of their annual sales came from Toys R Us in those days. So to to according to the record compiled by the Federal Trade Commission, Toys R Us went to each of the major toy manufacturers and they said two things and it's important that they said both. They said, number one, we don't want you to sell your most popular toys to the warehouse companies of, of the world. And number two, we are obtaining the same commitment from all of your competitors. And the record showed that some of the companies said, I'll agree with that as long as you can really assure me that the rest of my competitors are doing the same thing. And so that mirrored the facts of a very old and classic antitrust case, at least in the view of the Seventh Circuit. So I wrote the opinion for the Seventh Circuit explaining why that was illegal, explaining why Toys R Us was not preventing a so-called free riding problem, but was instead really just organizing a horizontal and yes. unlawful arrangement. Yes, I think it was an important, I remember it, so I think it was an important decision. I'm curious as to your view about the epigram decision. I believe it cited some of the decisions that you had written from the Seventh Circuit. Well, Justice Breyer wrote a wonderful opinion in the epigram case, and as I look at the opinions that have come out in the lower courts since Empegrand was decided, I think he achieved exactly what the Supreme Court was hoping for, which was to say there are limits to how far the statutes themselves allow U.S. enforcement to go. And if you have a situation where there are foreigners suing about harm that occurred to them in a foreign country, that is outside the boundaries that the statutes have drawn. And actually, Justice Breyer cites from amicus curiae filings that the court received from different governments, basically saying, look, there's got to be an end somewhere, and you're going to interfere with our enforcement if you butt in. And I'll add one very important point. One of the points they made was, if the United States is potentially in the picture, all sorts of amnesty programs and other kinds of programs designed to make people come in and reveal what's been going on would be threatened. Because we have the private right of action and mm -hmm. these other countries at this point really don't have that. That's right. That's right. Okay. In your view, what are some of the most important Supreme Court cases on antitrust law? Well, certainly the Sylvania case. That's which, what I was going to say. Which you began to that. Yes. Um, when I'm teaching antitrust, I usually suggest the following set of cases. Number one, going back a little bit before that, 1974, the General Dynamics case. That's a merger case. It's a case that emphasizes the need to look beyond the numbers. 
here are these numbers, but what do they mean? Do the numbers actually tell us anything about future competition? That way of thinking, I think, was at least um, given a new life in the general dynamics case. Maybe it didn't invent it. Sylvania is a second one. Another one I think is vitally important to where we are in antitrust today is the broadcast music case of the, the late 1980s, which says, again, you need to characterize what you are looking at. Is this a price-fixing arrangement? Well, at some simple level, it's price-fixing, but that's not really what it is. It's a joint venture. It's trying to do something productive. It's trying to put a new product on the market, in that instance, the blanket license for musical compositions. So that's, that's in my pantheon of, of very important antitrust decisions. Mm -hmm. In the vertical area proceeding forward, you've also got cases like Monsanto and Sharp and and others. Um, and we are, are recently the Legan. I was going to uh, ask you about the Legan decision. Yeah, the yes. Legan decision really definitely belongs there. But although some people think Legan really just is the other shoe dropping, and uh, that right. maybe it's in illogical. The, in the international antitrust area, is there any case? or development that you would point to as being particularly significant? Well, there are two cases the Supreme Court has issued. One is the one that you just mentioned, the um, Empigran case. The other was its earlier decision in the Hartford Insurance case. Yes. And Hartford Insurance was a, one of those five people on the court for one proposition and four for the other, and then they switched around. Um, for, for the boycott point. But Hartford is, is another very important case in that it shows how a service industry, the insurance industry, might be seen to be affecting the U.S. markets, mm -hmm. perhaps even through direct imports or direct action, even though in that instance the Lloyds syndicates were all sitting there in London, but the insurance risks they were insuring were in Pennsylvania and California and the United States. Mm -hmm. So it was a little hard to say that they didn't know they were involved with the United States. The Antitrust Modernization Commission, uh, what did you think about the report? Uh, was this what you had in mind when you said that the U.S. should learn from other countries? The Modernization Commission report is an excellent document, and they worked very hard on that. They did have to decide at the, at the outset, and this was a pragmatic decision for them to make, whether they were going to write a document that maybe somebody would pick up in 25 years and use as a template for action or whether they wanted to write a document that was suggesting feasible steps that could be taken right now. And I think they did opt for the second of those documents for all sorts of reasons we would all understand. Okay. And so at that more modest level, their suggestion to overturn Illinois BRIC surprised me quite a bit, but I will say as a judge, since we see indirect purchaser cases all the time under the diversity jurisdiction, it would be nice if we just had one rule on both sides of the table. Okay, so you would basically support, at least in principle, their recommendation. I, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to ask you a little bit about your personal advice that you would give to others. Um, what advice would you give to a law student today about the possibility of a career in antitrust law? I think the possibility is very good for a career in antitrust law. And I've had a number of students at the University of Chicago who have gone on to exactly that kind of career. And they're actually at all stages of seniority at this point in, in their respective firms. I think it's increasingly important if you want a career in antitrust to have a solid grounding in economics, not because you're going to be your own economist, but because you really want to know which questions to ask, you want to know what the other side's economist is saying, and it needs to make sense to you. Would you share with us any personal experiences or reflections that you have while serving on the federal bench? Should law students aspire to be federal judges? Sure. I mean, it's, I love being a judge. I wake up every morning and pinch myself that I was so fortunate as to be given this opportunity. And I say that having a commission dated June 30, 1995, and I still feel that way. And all of my colleagues do as well. The Seventh Circuit is, 
a very special court. We're a very small court of 11 judges, mm -hmm. so we work very closely with one another, and the responsibility, the intersection with people's lives in this part of the country, the intellectual challenge are second to none. Okay. You have been both a pioneer and a role model for women lawyers. Uh, what advice would you give to young women lawyers or to women aspiring to be lawyers? My primary advice to women lawyers from a professional standpoint is the same as I would give to a young man, such as my son, who is about to become a lawyer. Um, and that's just to, to do the best job you can do. I think the doors are largely open for women lawyers now, even though even I occasionally run into things that are maybe not quite all they should be. But uh, the question I get a lot from women lawyers is how have you managed a family and done what you've done? And my advice there is to say you have to decide first that you want the family. Everything else will fall in place if you have your priorities straight. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did, and luckily for me, the rest of it did fall in place. I think that's good advice. You've also been active in the ABA antitrust section. I believe you served as a judicial liaison for three years. Um, do you have any views as to what role the antitrust section has played or should play with respect to international antitrust law? The section has been great in international antitrust. It has helped support the ICN. It has increasingly internationalized its programs. It's brought in people not only to its annual meetings but to its other programs from other jurisdictions, which has helped American lawyers understand both where we're the same and where we're different. I'd like to ask you what are your professional goals at this point? If I understand correctly, uh, you will be the Chief Judge of the Seventh Circuit in six years. Congratulations. Uh, what I'd like to ask you is what are your goals uh, when you're serving in this position? Well, the first thing is to make sure that uh, I don't do anything to impede the Seventh Circuit from being the wonderful court that it is. I think the Seventh Circuit is um, a first-rate institution, and I guess I would simply hope to, to keep it that way, to make sure that it's open to the bar. I would love to see lawyers somewhat better trained in oral advocacy and brief writing. Uh, my standard when I read a brief, I hate to tell you, is whether the lawyer actually hit the side of the barn or not. Now, there are definitely lawyers who do much, much better than that, and there are some who don't quite even make that standard. Uh, so I want to see as, as productive a relation between bench and bar as I can possibly foster, and I think that will help us both. Mm -hmm. Aside from serving as a judge on the Seventh Circuit, do you see yourself playing a role in international antitrust law? I've been trying to, to back off from that a bit only because there's only so much time. I'm very interested in it. I do still participate, I, as I see it, wearing my academic hat, my University of Chicago hat, because I do still teach at the law school regularly. Um, but in some ways, I feel that the baton does have to pass along to, to others, and I'm hoping to encourage that to happen. Judge Wood, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. I'm sure everyone will appreciate everything you've had to say and your experiences and your memories. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure.